Amen, amen. Thank you, worship band. Thank you, ladies, for dancing. Praise the Lord. Wonderful worship, as always. Turn me up just a little bit. Can everybody hear me? What? We have an older crowd tonight. Well, we have a quick announcement. Uh, Arnold has uh, asked uh, my wife and I to share our ministry at CGF Ministries tomorrow at 3 o'clock in the cafeteria. Uh, so tomorrow, 3 o'clock, we'll be sharing about our ministry. If you'd like to come and attend and, and uh, ask a lot of questions, just don't ask a lot of hard questions like Joe the other night, the other night, so. It's a... It's a real blessing to be here. You know, it's an honor uh, for me to be able to teach here as well. Uh, my wife and I were just very glad to come. And, you know, we're only here for this one week, teaching on Galatians. So we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to come back next year as well and do some more teaching. And, but uh, it's always a blessing to be here and to share with all of you as well. Not only to teach, but also to fellowship with you and to share our love for the Lord. So... <laughs> Why not? Come on. Oh. I can't believe it. Hey. How's that? Is that teaching or not? <laughs> Only two. Okay. All right. Um. Now, just real fast, Dennis, back there, showing off that shirt. Yeshua is my chai, my shirt. I love Israel. Do you guys love Israel? Yes. Do you love the Jewish people? Yes. Well, that's what this means. You love the land of Israel, but you love the Jewish people as well. We wear T-shirts. Uh, I do it in Las Vegas. We have 80,000 Jewish people there, and it kind of brings the Jewish people to me helps them in a, in, a, in a sense to come and talk with me. And they see this, oh, you love Israel. It's got a Jewish star. And yes, I love Israel. How about you? And then we schmooze a little bit. And then guess what? We start talking about Yeshua, yes. And so we share the gospel with a lot of Jewish people that way. And so it's just kind of fun to be able to do that. And, and you know, I'd say, what, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, it's a, it's a good response when they see the shirt or, or we wear a Jewish star, David, with Jesus loves you or Yeshua loves you inside the star. And, and uh, it's just a, uh, it's a great way to meet Jewish people. They'll, they'll come to you if you see, if they, well, yeah, of course, they're going to see you like a mile away. And that's what usually happens. They see me coming and they're waiting for me to come. So, All right, let's get to our study. Tonight we're studying Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 through chapter 4 through 20. Last night we found out the truth of the good news message of freedom is always going to be confronted. And so we should be ready for this confrontational attack. Real quick example, Joshua came up to me after class last night and he said, You know, Rich, I, I've experienced everything you just taught us last night. He tells me all this. He just experienced this with a group of Torah observant people. And he says, they told me that I, to be saved, I have to be Torah observant. I've got to believe in Jesus, but I also have to be Torah observant to be saved. And of course, he was ready. He was ready to combat that attack and give them the truth. But uh, there's all different forms of this legalism within our Christendom as well. Water baptism, they add that to Salvation. They add that to believing in Yeshua. You've got Torah observance. And then add on anything else you want. There are lots of groups out there, folks. We always need to be ready for this confrontational attack. Shaul even called the Galatians foolish to think they could be justified by the works of the law. Messiah is the only one who can justify us and redeem us. In Galatians 3, he used two arguments to prove his point. First, he argued the, uh, from the Galatians' spiritual past experiences with Shaul's preaching. Did they receive the Spirit through the works of the law or by faith in the good news? The second one, he, he used the most important Jewish person 
in our history, the father of the Jews, Abraham, as a prime example. If we have faith like Abraham, then we shall be blessed rather than be cursed for failing to keep the law. Some Torah observant asked me the question, if this is true, then what is the purpose of the law? Well, there are many purposes for the law. One is for the Jewish people to become a nation of people following the one and only God. That was the original purpose God gave to Moses and the Jewish people. They were to be unique and set apart from the pagan nations. So the pagans, the Gentiles, would notice them and seek after the God of Israel. But Paul also gives us a couple of more purposes as we're going to be studying tonight. Chapter 3, look at verse 19. The section of Scripture from 19 to 29, I've entitled it, Why the Law Then? Why the Law? So he comes up with a couple of reasons here. Why the Law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. That word because of, it was added because of, means for the sake of defining. So the law was added to the promises of God to Abraham for the sake of defining and revealing sin in Jewish people's lives. So he added it, added the law to the, to the promises of Abraham there for the sake of defining and revealing sin in their lives. Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20 concurs with this, and I'd like to read these scriptures, so turn there with me. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Go back a few chapters, or through a few books here in your Bible. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And so when you're following the law, you're following all the commandments of, or trying to follow all the commandments of the law. Well, then guess what's going to happen to you? You are going to fail and you're going to recognize, come to the knowledge that you are a sinner. And you're breaking God's commandments. In addition, the law showed the Jewish people how utterly sinful their sin was. Turn to chapter 7 in Romans, verse 12 and 13. Special verses here that really go right along with Galatians and our theme. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. You know, God's word, all of it is holy, right? Holy, righteous, and good. But he's specifically talking about the law, the Mosaic law. Verse 13, Therefore did that which is good become a, cur uh, become a cause of death for me. May it never be. Rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. And that's the idea. If you continue to try and follow the law, well, then you're going to sin. But then the idea, you continue to follow it and follow it. God wants your heart to really understand that it's going to be utterly sinful, dramatically sinful in your life. My, uh, my, fr my good friend Richard Cooper, who comes to this camp first two weeks, and I, we have dealt with many, many Torah observant folks that have called us over the years because we have a congregation in Las Vegas that is Torah observant. There are two. Our congregation, which is freedom, all about freedom, and they're about Torah observant. And when they call us, though, they are shipwrecked in their faith. Because they've been trying to keep the Torah, trying to keep the commandments. The rabbi told me to keep trying. For years I've been trying and trying and trying and then finally, spiritually, they just collapsed. And that's exactly what we're reading right here, right? In Romans, in Galatians, eventually you're going to collapse spiritually because your sin just keeps on becoming utterly sinful. 
grows and grows and grows, and then you just collapse. Back to Galatians chapter 3. This is why it's such a danger for believers to try and do it. So the law was added because of transgressions ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. That mediator was Moses. Today's Jewish people claim that they do not need a mediator. Have you shared the good news with Jewish people before I have? And they say, well, I don't need Jesus. I don't need a mediator. And I just respond, well, what about Moses? What about Moses? What about Joshua, Samuel, the kings, the judges, the prophets, the Cohen, the Levites? They're all our mediators back then. They're all mediators. But here, Moses was the mediator between God and the Jewish people. And then he says, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Until, that word in the Greek it's always used of time to mean as long as or until. It's a time-sensitive word. The purpose of the law to show the Jewish people they were sinners would actually cease to exist. Until a time when the seed would come. And who is the seed? Yeshua. This purpose of the law then ceased. But why? Why would that happen? I believe... There would be a better way to show people that they are sinners. How about through the power of the Ruach Kodesh, the Holy Spirit. For the world, his job was to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And how about for believers? To also convict us when we sin, to confess of our sins as well. My grandmother, my grandmother is where I get my Jewish blood from. I'm a, I'm a mutt. I'm English and German Jewish. That's where the hill part comes from. That's my dad's side. I'm English there. My grandmother, she always told us that uh, she was not a sinner. Jewish grandmother never sinned in her life. Well, later on in her life, towards the end of her life, she got Alzheimer's disease. And it was a terrible, terrible couple of years that she lived at the end there. But Alzheimer's affects your mind and it makes you decrease in, well, in age and in intelligence, whatever you want to call it. But she ended up being about a seven-year-old little girl. And my sister, who was the born-again Christian at that time, I was not a believer at that time, she sent her a letter with the gospel in it. My grandfather read her the letter, and guess what? Faith like a child. She believed in Jesus, and she received Jesus. Only a child, right? Only a child. Well, my grandmother, of course, in her right mind, was never a sinner. But as a child, she was able to believe in Jesus. And so guess what? We praise the Lord for Alzheimer's, at least for my grandmother, even though she went through hell for a year and a half, two years. But she, we believe, she's saved. She was yelling out, Jesus, I believe, I believe, Jesus, and Jesus. And so the whole place, the whole hospital, the whole, you know, everywhere, wherever she was, and I got to see her, though, uh, before that actually happened, I got to see her there, and I was a young man. And I'll be honest with you, that's a terrible disease, folks. I saw her at the worst. And that was the first time and the last time that my family let me so see her. So it was a pretty mashugana. But that's the good news, right? And we'll be able to rejoice with her forever. But the issue, though, was she was convicted, finally. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin because we're sinners. Righteous because we're not righteous, are we? We are not righteous. Judgment because we are sinners. God is going to judge. 
And so here in this verse 19, the logical conclusion, since the Mosaic covenant was superseded by the new covenant, and since the mediator changed from Moses to Yeshua, would it not follow that the Mosaic law was superseded by Messiah's law? And if you look at Hebrews, you read chapter 7, of course, it is. Verse 20 now. Now a mediator is not only for one party only, whereas God is only one. So Moses was a mediator for two parties, God and Israel. However, Abraham, in his covenant, he did not have a mediator. God made the covenant without one. God was the mediator in that sense. This covenant is also therefore superior to the Mosaic covenant because of this reason. Verse 22, I mean 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. Remember yesterday we talked about this verse real fast. The law cannot impart life. Cannot impart eternal life either. Since the law cannot justify anyone, it cannot impart eternal life to anyone either. Even though the law brings condemnation on those who try to keep the law, the law does not work contrary to God's promises, but in conjunction with them. 22, but the scripture has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Yeshua HaMashiach might be given to those who believe. The scripture here specifically talking about law, all people need to realize they cannot keep all the commandments of the law. They have sinned and they've fallen short of God's glory and hence are cursed and will come under God's judgment in the end. This then should lead us to the need for the Lord and Savior in our lives. That's Yeshua, of course. So it should lead us to the need for a Lord and Savior. Every single person on earth needs a Lord and Savior, needs God in their lives. Verse 23. But before faith came, and here's that, that little uh, tidbit that Arnold has been teaching us, the word the is not included, but it, it is there in the Greek. But in the English, typically it's not there. So, but before the faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. So before we came to the faith in Yeshua, we were prisoners of our own sin and the law guarded over us, making sure we stay prisoners. Can you imagine that? The very law that the legalizers want to follow is the one that's making them prisoners of their own sin very opposite of what they believe it does. The word kept here in the Greek, it means to guard or to keep watch over. The law kept us in bondage to our sin and it shut us up. Greek there, to enclose or to imprison, to confine. And if anyone knows about prison and guards, it's definitely going to be Shaul, huh? No ding, huh? okay. Sin imprisoned us and shut us up to the faith so that we would not believe. Interesting, huh? It acts opposite of the way the legalizers want it to be. Therefore, when we came to faith in Yeshua, God broke us out of the prison of sin, right past the prison guard, broke us right out of the prison of sin, right past the prison guard of the law, so that we could live a life of freedom, not under the law again, but under Messiah Yeshua with the Ruach Chodesh as our new guard. So we're not only having a new law, a new mediator, but now we're having a new guard as well. And now you know what the cover of the book actually means if you've got the book. It comes right from this verse, verse 23. 24, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah that we may be justified by faith. Tutor means schoolmaster or guide. And the tutor had strict supervision over all life aspects of the children of the family. 
And so too, the law had strict supervision over our lives to bring us to Messiah. 25. But now that faith has come, again, the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Under here is hupo in the Greek, and when employed with an accusative noun, it means to be subject to, to be subordinated, subordination. And that's what hupo means here, subordination. So once we have faith in Yeshua, we are, not, uh, we are not to be subject or subordinated to the tutor or the Torah again. Therefore, we are no longer under the law as our guide, but under grace as our guide. Romans 6.14 tells us, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under, under grace. Verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Messiah Yeshua. So now Shaul changes from we to you. He says, For you, you Galatians. The Galatian believers were now sons of God through faith, as opposed to the legalizers who claimed to be sons of God through keeping of Torah. See, there's always this dichotomy that he is bringing up in, this, in these scriptures. Verse 27, For all of you who were baptized into Messiah have clothed yourselves with Messiah. This immersion he's speaking of here is the spiritual baptism. When we become believers of Yeshua, we are baptized by the Ruach Chodesh into Messiah, but also into the body of Messiah. I like Romans chapter 13, 14. If you're taking notes, it says, Put on the Lord Yeshua. Put on the Lord Yeshua. And that's kind of what we're talking about here spiritually. Put him on. It's like putting on a jacket. And guess what? Never take it off. Never take him off. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. Now, if you've been here before, if you've been to camp, you've been here a number of times, you've heard this verse before, you've heard it analyzed and discussed, so I'm going to add to that as well just a little bit. Quoting this verse, many Gentile believers question whether Messianic Jews should celebrate and worship in a Jewish context. I've heard this one a number of times, teaching in the churches. Inevitably, someone comes up to me afterward and just says, well, you know what, there's no Jew or Gentile anymore, so why are you in a Messianic congregation? And so now I have to go into a little dissertation about this verse and explain it to them. So they typically believe that this verse teaches that there's no need for any Jewish distinctive in the believer's life. Since there's no Jew, there's neither Jew nor Greek. When confronted with these statements, usually ask the Gentile believer this question, since you believed in Yeshua, did you stop becoming male or female? And I'm sure many of you are using that as well. Obviously, we take this scripture metaphorically rather than literally. Although, uh, unfortunately, you know, the world nowadays, there's a whole lot more than just male and female. I'm waiting. Shouldn't be that way in the congregations, though, right? All right. So the point, we are all one in Messiah. Spiritually, we are all one in Messiah. The New Testament continues to bring those distinctives, Jewish and Gentile, yes. But the point is we're all one in Messiah. God does not treat us differently because one is a Jew, one is a Gentile. Or whether one is a male or whether one is a female. He loves us all the same. He loves us all the same. Verse 29, If you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Seems like every 10 verses or so, he brings back Abraham and that promise, you know, the covenant. He likes to bring that back in. And so that's an important aspect. So if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's offspring or seed, heirs according to promise. 
Not physically, but spiritually. Through God's promise to Abraham. Many Gentiles believe they become Jewish because of this verse. But it's not saying this. It would be better to say that I am a Messianic Gentile. I'm a Messianic believer. Instead of saying, I am a Messianic Jew. If you're not Jewish, if you don't have Jewish blood in your, in your system. Question though. Are Jewish people who do not receive Yeshua considered Abraham's seed? Interesting, huh? I break this answer up. Physically, of course, yes, they are Jewish. But spiritually, in the end, no. Turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It's another famously uh, misunderstood scripture. Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not for men, but from God. So as he's making this contrast or this comparison, he's saying true Jewish people are the ones that are inwardly circumcised of their heart toward who? Toward Yeshua. Believers. Believers. So he's not really saying that physical Jews are no longer physical Jews. He's not saying that at all. Now Galatians chapter 4. Shaul told the Galatians the two purposes of the law, to define and reveal personal sins to the Jewish people and understand the law was their tutor to bring them to the saving knowledge of Yeshua. Once they became sons of God, Shaul told them to act like they were sons of the Almighty God. So they were to act like they were sons of God and not act like they were slaves to the law. So that is his exhortation to these Galatians and to the legalizers. Be sons of God, not slaves under the law. Verse 1 through 11, that's the title. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. So the idea that the law has become our tutor to lead us to Messiah is now expanded in this section. In the first century, the tutors of children were typically slaves. Slaves is the answer there in your notes. Who were given power and authority by the master or the father of the household. Even though the child would eventually receive the inheritance of the family or the father. And ultimately become the master. At the time he was a child, he was still viewed as similar to the slave who was in charge of him. And now we've got a great biblical example of this. Joseph with Potiphar in Egypt. He was in charge of Potiphar's whole household. And yet he was a slave. Verse 2. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. And so the child was placed under the authority of the guardian or the manager until the date set by the master. Until again, time, a time sensitive word. So once the set date was reached, well, then the child was no longer under the tutor's authority. Isn't this a wonderful example that Paul's giving us? Similar was the situation with the Jewish people and the law. The Lord placed them on the authority of the law until the set date. The set date was the death and resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah. Once Jesus came, faith then replaced the law as the authority over all those who would believe. Verse 3. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. The elemental things of the world is a reference to the law. Once again, Shaul is not being very nice. He's saying, this is childish. This is kids' laws, kids' rules. We were held in bondage under the law until Messiah set us free. 
We were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Verse 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. It's a fascinating phrase right there, born under the law. We'll talk about it. In the fullness of time, certainly this involves the Pax Romana. That's the peace under Rome, where the world had peace under the rule of Rome. But this fullness means much, much more than that. I know a lot of commentaries just like to write about the Pax Romana and just bring about all those physical things, but, and that's wonderful, and it's definitely a part of it. You know, all the new building up of cities and building up of roads and, and you know, bringing peace to the world. As long as you didn't fight against Rome, well then, you know, Rome was happy. They were okay. Just don't, don't mess with Rome and the law. But this fullness means more than just that. The time was right for God to begin his fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning his son. Concerning his son and his first coming. His son. Right here in verse 4, God sent forth his son. You know, Judaism doesn't have a theology concerning God's son. Many of the Jewish people today don't, God doesn't have a son, what are you talking about? I hear that a lot when I'm talking about, hey, God has a son. Well, when you get to the Tanakh, clearly de uh, declares that God has a son. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, I, I look at it as being clear. Psalm 2 as well. God has a son. He's born of a woman. He's born of a woman. This refers to the fact that the Son of God would also be the man, Messiah of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. More scriptures talking about God's Son. Chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 as well. It's a great description of the God-man. Arnold was talking about the God-man as well these last few days. This is an important aspect of understanding exactly who Yeshua is. 100% God, 100% man. I remember telling a, a Jewish young lady many years ago on campus and, and talked about this 100% God, 100% man. God came down as a man. And it was a permanent change for him. And, and I said, you know, it's in the old covenant scriptures where God became a man. And so we went to, to Genesis chapter 18 and I, we showed it to her, read it to her. I said, look, God right here and he's talking to Abraham and he eats with him and he talks with him. God became a man temporarily here. I said, why can't God permanently become a man? God the Son. And that's exactly what God the Son did in Yeshua. He's born under the law. Yeshua was placed under the authority of the law, just like every other Jewish person was. He would then have to listen and obey all the commandments like everyone else. However, everyone else broke the commandments and became sinners under God's eyes. Yeshua, however, did not break any commandments, was declared sinless by the law, which is an important aspect of being born under the law, so that the law could declare him sinless. And hence was able to fulfill the law and the requirements of the Messiah. So he was then proven to be the perfect sacrifice to redeem the Jewish people and the world. Proven to be the Messiah for the Jewish people. Question, did Yeshua follow all 613 commandments? It's a trick question. Because he couldn't follow all 613 commandments. He's not a priest under the Aaronic. He's not a Levite. He did not sacrifice animals for sin, did he? So he did not follow those commands. <coughs> He couldn't do all of them. He couldn't go into the temple and sacrifice, right? So many of the 
Many of the commandments are talking about the, you know, the priests and the Levites sacrificing for the people. He wasn't able to do those. But of course, he fulfilled all of the ones that he was able to do. Yes, of course. Verse 5. Let's move on. In order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Redeem here means in the Greek to deliver, to buy back, to rescue or ransom. So Yeshua delivered and he rescued the Jewish people. He actually bought them back, right? Paid the ransom for their sins and for all as well. But specifically here we're talking about redeeming those who were under the law. So those Jewish people that were under the law, Yeshua rescued them from the law. Those who would repent and believe in him would become sons of God. In verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba is a common Aramaic word used by the Jewish Israeli children as an endearing title for their fathers. And here, Shaul uses it for God the Father. Verse 7, therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Believers are no longer slaves or servants to sin or to the law, but are chosen by God to be sons, to be sons and friends of the Lord, to live in freedom, to bring forth good works performed by faith and love for the Lord. Therefore we should keep our eyes fixed on Yeshua and the prize of our inheritance, and give him the glory for it all, crying out to him, Abba, Abba Father. Verse 8. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. So he's talking about here before they personally knew Yeshua, they were slaves of Hasatan and his demons. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless, elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Since you have become known by God, why are you going back to the weak and worthless, elemental things? Again, Paul gets very strong with these legalizers. These are the good works associated with keeping Torah for sanctification reasons. And he says they're weak and they're worthless. That's pretty strong, isn't it? In Judaism, that's very strong. How can you tell someone who's following the law and, trying, and following the commandments, trying to, to please God that way and saying it's weak and worthless? It's, it's not working, folks. It doesn't work for you. This verse has to be detrimental effect on the Messianic movement today of the legalizers. And that if the law was such an important part of our walk with the Lord, well then, why is Shaul calling it weak and worthless? Why are the legalizers telling Joshua that you've got to do this to be saved? Well, they also said, Paul is not, he's a, he's a false apostle, and we don't even read his, his writings. Well, now you know why. Because it contradicts exactly what they're saying. Verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. The obvious meaning here is that the Galatians were keeping the commandments of the law for salvation and or for sanctification reasons. They were enslaved all over again by the law, even though they were believers of Yeshua who gave them power to live above the law in freedom. Now Paul is definitely not coming out against us celebrating the feasts and even celebrating the Shabbat. He's talking about the heart behind it. They're doing it for sanctification reasons. They're doing it all for possible salvation reasons as well thinking that they're pleasing God by their good works. Verse 11, I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. 
again, this, this fear, this fear of, of laboring over them in vain, that it was worthless. He complains against these Galatians, just like the prophets of old complained of pleading with Israel to no avail and, and had hoped that their devotion was not in vain. And that's what Paul is saying here. I don't believe he, he did not think that they were already saved, but I think he was saying is, I want you to repent. I want you to come back. And until you do, then I'm going to have this, this idea about whether I was working in vain with you or not. In chapter 4, verse 12 through 20, Shaul encourages to maintain your freedom from the law. In this last section, Shaul showed the Galatians that they were no longer slaves to the law, but sons of the living God. Now that they had become adopted sons of God and received a great inheritance through faith in the one and only Yeshua, the question remained, why would they then turn back and be enslaved all over again to the weak and worthless law? Now in this section of chapter 4, the conveyed message is that once believers have received our freedom from the law, we need to maintain that freedom from the law. Verse 12, I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. And so Shaul simply wanted the Galatians to repent and turn back to being free in the Ruach, being free in the Spirit, just like he was, and just like they were at the beginning of their walk with the Lord. Shaul's motto, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can turn there in your Bibles, verse 19 to 23. I want to read this. I'm sure most of you know these scriptures. This is motto for ministry. 19 through 23. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law that I might win those who are under the law. And so he was willing to go the extra mile to share the good news with all different kinds of people. Those who are under the law, the legalizers. He acted as if a legalizer. Verse 21, to those who are without law as without law. Though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Messiah, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I, that I may be all, uh, by all means save some. I can do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And so the idea here is in his witnessing, to Jews and to Gentiles, he was all things to all people. So that some would hear the good news, that some would be saved. This is his ministry. This is his motto. So he had become all things to all people. Verse 13. And so back in uh, verse 12, this is why he says, you know, I beg of you. Become as I am, free in Messiah. Verse 13, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Shaul had contracted a despised illness, probably the eye disease, based on other clues from other scriptures, like chapter 4, verse 15, and chapter 6, verse 11. And so Shaul caused the Galatians to remember their past history so that they would cherish the close relationship that they had with him, and therefore to listen and obey his present counsel. So look what he says here, verse 14, And, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, 
but you receive me as an angel of God, as Messiah Yeshua himself. So the idea here is clear that the Galatians would have eas or could have easily rejected Shaul when he came and shared the good news with them because of this eye disease. But they did not treat him with contempt. In fact, the very opposite occurred. They received him as if he were an angel, an angel from heaven or even Messiah himself. And so he's trying to cause them to remember, go back. You guys were living in the spirit back then, but now, but now you're not even my friend anymore. What happened? Right? What happened? Who bewitched you? Remember our history together. Verse 15 and 16. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? You know, sometimes you, we think, you know, when, when I was a young believer, boy, I was in the Spirit and, and I was just praising the Lord and, and preaching the Word everywhere. And then what happened? What happened now I'm 20, 30 years older and I'm hunching over and I'm getting tired? Where then is that sense of blessing you had? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? They loved them so much at the beginning that... that he believed that they would have given them their own eyes if they could do so. So why would the Galatians not maintain their freedom? Why would they give up all those blessings, follow the legalizers down the wrong spiritual road, and then treat Shaul like an enemy? These are all the unfortunate consequences that all believers can fall into if we fall back into this Torah observance. For Torah's sake. That's a pretty bad situation, isn't it? Give up all the blessings. Go down the wrong spiritual road. Treating mm -hmm. your, your, your spiritual father there. Who started the congregations. Like he was an enemy. And he did nothing for that, right? Verse 17, they eagerly seek you, they meaning the legalizers, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out in order that you may seek them. This philosophy is similar to when the Pharisees would put Jewish people out of the synagogues because they believed in Yeshua. And so it makes them outcasts in Jewish society, and so maybe then they'll conform back and come back. Maybe they'll give up Yeshua and come back. So they can get back into the synagogue. That's the idea here. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I am present with you. So he continues the comparison of himself and the legalizers. They sought the legalizers in an evil way. I mean they sought the Galatians in an evil way. But Shaul's was commendable. Verse 19, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Messiah is formed in you. Shaul appeals to the Galatians now as he calls them my children. It's an endearing term that he gives to them. They are his spiritual children. But they need to become mature believers before Shaul can move on in the ministry with them. That's why he says, I'm in labor again with you. And finally, verse 20, but I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Shaul has been very strong and even harsh with the Galatians. In chapter 3, verse 1, he called them foolish. He expresses his wish to be there in person and to tone down his attitude. He's obviously very puzzled and perplexed over the Galatians. Their desire to follow Torah for sanctification is unbiblical. 
and Shaul was very perplexed about it. And so tonight we've learned the law's purpose, not the only purpose, but a couple of the purposes here that Paul wanted to bring out for the Galatians' understanding, and ours as well, to divine and reveal sin and to show how utterly sinful it is in our lives, the Jewish people's lives as well, that the law was our guard and our tutor to bring us to Messiah. The, Lord, the law guarded us as we were in our prison of sin before we came to Messiah. But it also helped us to bring us to the truth of Messiah. And once we made it, then we become sons of God. But the question, why go back? Why go back to a system of worship that God has deemed old? He's given us a new way. He's given us the Ruach Hades, the Holy Spirit. No need to go back. We are free of the law, free of following the commandments of the law and its system of worship. So the idea tonight to maintain that freedom from the law. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are mighty and awesome and wonderful. We thank you for the clarification of the purpose of the law and the idea that it bring and it brought us to Messiah to be saved and to live a life that is holy and righteous and just, but not by our power, but by the Ruach's power, by the Holy Spirit. But help us to be free of even our own laws at times that we make, Lord, that are not in line with you. Sometimes we like to make up our own rules and regulations, Lord. That can hurt us in the spiritual realm. And so we pray, Lord, that you will reveal and that you will glorify your name in our lives each and every day. And help us to be led by the Spirit and maintain that freedom that we have from the law in the Spirit. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you all. So we got six minutes before nine. We'll give you a five minute break. And we will start the entertainment. So... Talent entertainment? Entertainment talent? Yeah, that's correct, Lauren. Sorry, it's not entertainment, it's talent. <laughs>